look, everything is about survival um, for all of these guys. So if you see something, and it's all, it's just a couple ants here and there. Well, guess what? You were probably only seeing about 10% of what that extra colony is and not taking care of it, especially professionally. Um, they're just going to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. I mean, there is no slowing them down. Welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm Show with Bob Preston. Bob is the CEO, owner, and broker of North County Property Group, the fastest growing and top ranked property management company in San Diego County, California. This podcast is for property managers and real estate investors who want to stay on top of leading trends in managing their property assets. You'll hear from leading professionals on the best practices for growing your property management business, successfully renting your properties, and how to make sure your properties are managed correctly. Now, here is your host, Bob Preston. Welcome to all you brainstormers who are listening in today. This is Bob Preston, your host of the show, broadcasting from our studio at North County Property Group in Del Mar, California. If you're new here, please subscribe so you have ongoing access to all of our great episodes. And if you like what you hear, please pay it forward with a positive review. As a real estate investor and property manager, it's always a challenge dealing with pest control in our rental properties. I know our properties here in San Diego will frequently have issues with ants during the summer months when things get dry and it's hot out. Also, one of the issues we may face is if pest control is a tenant responsibility, most leases say it is, or is that really practical and should it be the responsibility of the landlord, for example, in cases of a more severe infestation? With me on the show today is Tom Clements of Pest Share, a company with a new approach to pest control with the goal of happier tenants and property owner savings. We're going to be diving into some of these questions today and talk in general about pest control and why it's important for your rental properties. Tom, hey, thanks for being here today and welcome to the show. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. You bet. Hey, I always like to start our show by having my guests introduce themselves and tell us a bit about themselves and your company. So Tom, why don't you kick us off today with that? My name is Tom Clements. Um, my business partners and I have been in pest control for, oh, wow, well, shoot, one of them been in like fourth generation. Um, so we ended up having this idea that we wanted to come to was like, you know, bugs are always going to be around. How do we deal with it? How do we make it a a benefit for property managers? How do we make it so it's cheap enough to the tenants don't actually have to go, you know, crazy high cost trying to afford something like that. So this is kind of where pest share comes in is a, a meld of property managers and pest control company come together and creating a very real benefit for the owners, uh, the property managers, and obviously the tenants as well. Terrific. Let's start with some basics. And this may seem obvious, but why is pest control so important when it comes to rental property care? It just kind of depends on what is the extent of the pest problem. I mean, everybody's had ants and spiders, and um, but then it comes down to these like roaches and bed bugs. And we're just looking at these pests, all of these pests live somewhere. And when we start taking over their territories, well, guess where they got to go? They start living in the walls. They start living under, in the crawl spaces um, and do damage to the whole property, one. But then you also got a, health, a bit of a health hazard. Definitely not a sanitary thing. So keeping them under control, pretty much everybody's benefit. I'm not saying pest eradication because pests are needed on the earth too. But we want to keep them under control in the place you live as well. Have this happy medium in there. Yeah, well, I think certain pests can definitely be a health issue, right? Rats and mice, their droppings, their urine. Yeah, so uh, deer mice uh, specifically care of the hantavirus. Mm -hmm. What we want to make sure of is that we're properly managing it because mice and rats, they go into different territories. Ants, uh, they crawl over everything. Let's take flies, for example. Where do they go? <laughs> yeah. Not the most pleasant of places. So just being aware and keeping places cleaner than normal is helpful. When a pest issue emerges, it's important to get it reported and to take action quickly, right? What are the ramifications? I'm sure you've seen some horrible infestations, right? So tell us about some of the ramifications you've seen when things don't get controlled quickly. Easiest answer with that one is reproduction. I mean, if you let things go, look, everything is about survival um, for all of these guys. So if you see something and it's all, no, it's just a couple ants here and there. Well, guess what? You were probably only seeing about 10% of what that extra colony is and not taking care of it, especially professionally. Um, they're just going to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. I mean, there is no slowing them down unless they're controlled and managed for. 
And so that is where a professional company comes into play as well versus just going to the store and getting something like some a Home Depot raid or home defense or something like that. Professionally done, these products can actually target the nest and get a hold of these things and make sure that not just the surface area is getting uh, maintained, but also the colonies and nesting sites, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I've heard that said about cockroaches. You know, if you see one, oh, yeah. if you see one cockroach, okay, that's the tip of the iceberg. There's probably thousands somewhere, you know, nearby. Right. But do you find that to be true? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. So they reproduce very quickly. And usually, yeah, if you're seeing the one, you definitely got a problem because they like, they don't like to be seen. They're going to live in these very tight corners. Typically, the rule of thumb is, you know, uh, three points of pressure on a cockroach. You know, they're flat for a reason. They like uh, isolation and dark places. So, mm. you know, underneath a, a, a dishwasher or, you know, that little space on top of the dishwasher, they like to go in there quite often, damp, um, dark. Um, they don't like to be bothered. But if you start seeing them, you know, fairly frequently, you got a lot more than you really realize. I remember one time. Uh, one of the houses I owned one night, I could hear this little sort of chick, 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 chick. <laughs> chittering across the board. Well, no, yeah. it was up in the attic, you know, and I'm kind of, that's oh. kind of weird, whatever, you know, I kind of ignored it. And then, you know, I hear some footsteps, you know, little, 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 you know, things running across, eh, whatever, you know, and then before you knew it, know it, I had this, you know, entire rat infestation in my attic, Ah, yeah, you know, and they came up through a plant and got into the attic somehow. And, and it doesn't take oh my much. God, it was a, it was a mess yeah. and it took for, then they reproduced. It took forever to clean it up. Right. And then they started chewing on wires. They chewed through our, chewed through our phone, phone line, believe it or not. So our phone uh, yeah. went out. That was back in the day when you had landline. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm a big believer, man. You gotta, you gotta nip this stuff in the bud quickly. And it does not take much for these guys to get into anything. I mean, look at how small an ant is. I mean, their mm -hmm. point of view and getting it at a home. Yeah, we like to think all of our homes are perfectly sealed up and everything like that, but there's no way. I mean, to keep an ant out, you see the things they crawl through. It's like you sometimes you can't even see what they're coming through, in a, but they are coming out of it. It's like, how in the world can you get through a hole that small? I can barely see it. So there's no hiding them, um, at least keeping them out. You just got to control for them and make sure that, you know, you're doing the right things. And that's what kind of where we come in. I'm assuming though, that some level of siding pests in your property is normal and shouldn't be alarming. Like, you know, I know we see occasional silverfish and stuff like that. I mean, at what, at what point do you go, wow, okay, that's kind of normal. I'm not going to worry about that. And at what point do you go, whoa, this needs to be treated? So a lot of that is very much personal preference. Like I was saying, we're not here to eradicate the world of pests. Um, yeah. There's a balance with it. But what we want to make sure is that like, your definition of an infestation, Bob, is probably going to be different than mine. Um, I've been in pest control quite a while, so I'm not very used to seeing bugs in my home. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I have it treated you know, pretty frequently. Mm -hmm. um, you might be different. I don't know. I'm just kind of uh, guessing here. But at the same time, if you see you know, 100 ants kind of in a line on the countertop, maybe it's gross to you. Maybe it's not. The point is, if it is, there's, now we have a solution, Right. And not an expensive one and a very affordable one for everybody at this point. But whereas before it's, well, do I want to spray my countertop with Raid? Probably not. It's not a great idea because then when you do, you got to clean it off. And guess what? It's no longer effective. Let's use the right products. Let's use the right stuff. And just most pests are going to be based on tolerance. Uh, going back to your original question, there is a personal preference. The hardest part, though, is not everybody sees pests as a problem at all. I actually went to an apartment complex um, where there were roaches everywhere where you just would step on them, like oh just crunch, goodness. crunch. Wow. It was it was ridiculous. That is not a personal preference thing. That is a very big health hazard. And sometimes this is where a property manager has to step in and say, look, I have an owner that I need to protect the property for. And you're not doing this. I need to get this taken care of. Okay. Probably to a certain extent depends upon where you live, right? Your, yeah. your geographic area and also even in your particular microclimate. We live in a canyon that's near the coast and we have things that are unique to us. And we, we've got it all. We've got mice. We've got, not in our house, but I mean, on the property. You know, we sure, see it yeah. on rats, 
uh, mice, skunks, possums, raccoons. I mean, we see the full gamut, right? <laughs> yeah. I think I was sharing with you, we chatted last week that there were these little tiny spiders that are all over the San Diego coastal, you know, Southern California coast. And they're not really harmful, but they're annoying because you have yeah. to wipe the webs away, right? So some of it is a matter of personal tolerance and what mm-hmm. you're used to and what's in your particular area, right? Your geography makes a huge difference. Like, I mean, up here in Idaho, for example, I mean, roaches aren't as big of a thing. If I'm going to go to Florida, there's, yeah, I mean, roaches yeah. are just part of life, uh, actually. And that speaks volumes to, you know, say people move and there's a lot more people who can move across the country. But um, even from when I was younger, it wasn't as uh, actively moving across country or anything like that. It's a lot easier to do so. So somebody from Florida comes up to our place in Idaho and, and starts living here. Well, guess what? It's like, ah, there's no bugs up here. But if I go down to Florida and I was like, I'm going to set up residence there. I'm be like, what did I just move into? Like, no, this is, nope. I'm going back. Like, yeah. Preference, tolerance, big deal. (laughs) And it's just geography. Like you said. So it occurs to me that some tenants and property owners might be sensitive to people spraying certain types of what they perceive as being chemicals in their homes. What Mm -hmm. do you say about that? How safe are the chemicals? Are different chemicals used depending upon the problem? Educate us on what is used to, I guess, control pests within the household and the environmental safety. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, okay. So the big, the nicest thing about pest share is this, it's not this ongoing pest control all the time, you know, that's happening, you know, at monthly, quarterly, whatever it is, it is at your choice and convenience. So whether you choose to use it or not, you don't have to, if you do have a tolerance um, or not, not a tolerance, a sensitivity to chemicals and things like that, you can completely avoid it. um, If you want to, there just comes the point to where say you are dealing with a bed bug uh, or roach infestation or something like that, then it has to happen. So if you do have a sensitivity to it, which is very, very rare because we don't carry typically the proper enzymes to be able to uh, affect us. It has all been designed to go after these certain targets. And honestly, every single label has a target pest on them. Some have multiple target pests and others are very specific. We don't try and just, you know, spray and pray everywhere and hope it works. It's very selective in where you're, the professionals, the vendors are treating uh, to make sure that you're controlling for the proper thing and not just everything that might be around. Like that's just bad practice. Okay. Um, well, let's say you're a tenant and you do have a sensitivity or maybe, maybe you don't know if you have to have a sensitivity, but you, you might have a worry for it. Well, not a problem. You can go ahead and leave the property. Uh, it's recommended that you can be out for about an hour because once the product dries, it has absolutely no effect on you. All right. It's more just the idea of inhalation, um, or contact with the eyes, the most sensitive parts of the body. So if you avoid that altogether, yeah, you're going to be totally fine. There's no residue that wants to bound to the surface area that is going to affect um, you as an individual. Okay. What about termite treatments too? I mean, obviously there's, there's extremes where you have to tent the house and fumigate. There's local treatments now, I think using, I think it's orange oil. Right. And I've even heard of this device. It's some sort of an electrode where you, you know, kind of electrocute the termites. Are those types of treatments effective? Sure. Some are. Um, And there's a lot of uh, gimmick products. And here's, so here's what ends up happening is you're going to find some things that do work. You're also going to have some things that more of the pseudoscience, it might work for a short term or just based on natural foraging habits, they move away and it looks like something works. So a lot of testing and time has gone into all of these products. I mean, we're talking decades. Um, Once something, and then there's tolerances even for the pest. So once something starts to be ineffective or notice that there might be an effect to a population, it is revamped, reworked, chemically um, redone to make it even safer uh, for the individual and still at least as effective. Uh, It's just a matter of the rate of application. Um, And all of these, in almost every state, your vendor, your provider, your pest control provider has to be licensed for and take these uh, mandated tests to perform the service. Right. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, like Home Depot remedies, right? Or whatever you want to call them, drugstore remedies. There are these little supersonic, uh, silent 
mouse chasers. Okay. They might run away from your kitchen, but then they're in your, in your pantry or something. I don't know. Well, and that's kind of the thing. So that supersonic stuff, um, with a, that supersonic sounds bouncing up the walls, it's actually not within the walls where most of your mice are going to be living anyway. That's I mean, right. there's insulation and safety there. So it reverberates, um, off the walls, not within them. So they can still hide out in a crawl space in a wall mm -hmm. and reproduce in those areas kind of right under your nose. Yeah. And then, by that point, once they've done so, then you start getting these weird smells and uh, then it's almost too late. I mean, it's not too late, but in your head, you're thinking, I dang it, I wish I would have done something sooner. To your point, you guys are licensed professionals. Pest control companies have a license. They know what products they're using and they know the proper way to administrate them. I had a pet one time, a large golden retriever who died of rat poisoning. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, it was not pleasant. They nope. got, there was a big wind condition or gate blew open or dog got into someone else's backyard who had open rat bait out for a problem that they were self-treating and the dog ate the poison. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm not going to go through gory details, but my dog died from it. So it's really important to administer things the right way. I think going back to that rat infestation we had in my attic a few years back, you know, we put out some bait stations up there. And of course, then you get the stinkers, right? I think you alluded yeah. to it. They, they, it is effective in broad treatment, but uh, then you have the rats die basically in your attic or in your wall. And then that is also not a pleasant experience unless you're able to find the animal. Right. So yeah. um, getting people who know what they're doing, the best way to trap the animals and, and deal with the particular pest is really, really important. I'm sure you wouldn't dispute that, <laughs> that opinion. <laughs> Okay. So some things kind of aren't treatable, right? We were chatting about this a little bit. About three years ago, we had a huge mosquito problem in San Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not so much lately because we're in the middle of a drought, right? So there were almost <laughs> yeah. none this summer, but a few summers ago. And so we had some tenants complain, oh my God, we got this huge uh, mosquito problem. Well, what the heck are we supposed to do about that? It's kind of dicey. Now there might be standing water on their property that they're not paying attention to, stuff like that. So there might be something that could be done, but in most cases, mm -hmm. it's just sort of a you know, geographical zone problem. There's not always the same option for pests as another. They don't translate directly over. Like one treatment for ants isn't going to be the, uh, the same effect as it like you bring up mosquitoes. And now that doesn't mean that there isn't anything that we can do for it. Maybe just the longevity or the residual effect of that product use for, uh, let's for instance, mosquitoes isn't going to be as long. So we actually do mosquito treatments up here as well. Um, we do a misting and a fogging um, okay. method mm -hmm. for it, and it works great, uh, but it doesn't work as long. Like it breaks down quicker and it doesn't last as long in the environment, and so it needs to be treated more often. Everything has, I would say, oh, not everything. I would say most things have a solution. It's just a matter of how creative and how diligent you can be with the problem. Uh, you say mosquitoes. Well, usually the Biggest, well, the, the biggest source is standing water because those eggs are laid underneath, under, underneath that water. Getting Removing a lot of that, um, we call it exclusion work, is going to be the greatest source for pest control you can do. Is get rid of the reason that bugs want to be at your property, and it's going to make the biggest difference. Beyond that, well, sure, we have extenuating circumstances. We can't control everything, so when it does happen and pests show up, here we are. Yeah, we've had a couple of bee infestations this past year, too, you know, and <laughs> that's always kind of shocking and a little bit scary for the residents sure. at the time. We had one resident calling, yes, this property's horrible. You know, I've got I've got bees that are coming onto my property. Well, you know, I hate to tell you, Mr. Tent, there's not much we can do about that, you know, except now treat it. Typically, we try to do that humanely, right? So there are some yep. things that uh, require some specialties. I would think that bees are one of them, particularly here in Southern California. You guys probably don't have it in Idaho, but, you know, we've got this Africanized bee population now, the quote unquote killer bees. Uh, and they're very yeah. aggressive, right? So it's something that's pretty important if they're, you know, getting into the house or they're getting into your walls. That really has to take, be taken care of quickly, but they come in from anywhere. Nothing to do with the house. We've seen quite a few times a honeybee um, population come through and create a hive within the soffits of a home yeah. or shoot one time in the chimney. And it is a mess. I mean, it really is. The problem is, is we don't want to go and just kill all the honeybees. I mean, that's, I mean, they're short, and su they're short enough supply anyway. So we try to extract them um, in all cases first. And that's where beekeepers come in um, and all that. And they can use smoke and a bunch of their own different methods, just having professional knowledge of uh, how and where you're treating. 
uh, because products can affect these guys. So if you just spray everywhere because I don't like earwigs or I don't like spiders, I want them all dead. Well, if you're not thinking about the other pests around your property that are needed as well, you might be affecting them. We call it IPMA, Integrated Pest Management. So we want to make sure that we're doing the proper procedures for every pest and not just killing bugs because it's a bug. So, yeah, in our landscape areas around San Diego County, too, we have a lot of white flies. Yep. We have, I think they're called mealy bugs or mealy worms. Do I have that right? Okay. But there are now laws against some of these pesticides that can be used in particular on flowering plants, right, to protect bee populations. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly. really important that these all be done properly. And it drives me crazy when I see some, you know, big truck uh, spraying like a flowering tree in our neighborhood. I mean, it's just like indiscriminate, <laughs> yeah. right? Really, really wrong. And uh, there are a lot of now city ordinances, I'm sure you're seeing it too, that outlaw that kind of indiscriminate spraying. And every state's a little bit different. Um, and so every pest control vendor in that state, which is why we vent them, and we we know all the state's bylaws and everything like that as far as pest control is concerned anyway. Uh, so they need to make every vendor needs to make sure that they're abiding by those standards and we have a rating system for them as well so if they're not uh providing the best service for the tenant um and they get negative feedback and things like that we want to make sure that what you know any everybody is getting the best service and if somebody's not providing it well let's find somebody else it's usually not that big of an issue but okay so let's get back to pest share and your value proposition thanks sure. for kind of schooling us on some of the details of pest control in general that's super helpful to our audience i'm sure so it seems like the value proposition that you guys bring is kind of the power of numbers you have uh, pest control companies that you contract with at a discounted rate that are all over the country right mm -hmm. in other words if a property manager's property portfolio is pooled together to protect their homes and families the cost of that pest control significantly drops while everyone enjoys a safety and kind of luxury of a pest-free home. Tell us about that. How does it work? Maybe you can even walk us through a typical scenario of a tenant who requests pest control sure. and how that would work for either an individual investor who has a multiple properties or a property manager. Yeah, it's basically on a monthly basis um, on a per door um, aspect. So um, on the tenant side of things, it just comes as part of the lease and mm -hmm. rent agreement or something like that. I mean, it's almost like, I don't know if you've ever used this analogy in your business. It's almost like buying a pest control warranty, right? You're paying a small amount each month, but then you get certain treatments for yeah, free if a problem should emerge. So so let's assume uh, my company, North County Property Group, we have our properties under your program. Uh, we find out that there's a problem. Yeah. A tenant complains about something. Take me through the scenario on how that gets reported, who submits the request. You know, do we do it as a property manager? Does the tenant do it? Uh, then what happens yeah. all the way from the initial identification of the problem all the way through the treatment being taken at the property? Generally, Pesher, we designed it so that the tenant can handle the solution on their own pretty simply. So pestshare.com is where they would go. And that site can also be linked to your site uh, as well so that they already have a trusted site they can go to. But then all they're going to do is click pest share. And then they're going to request a service. Uh, simple as that. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what their name is and the basic contact information, phone or email. Enter those in, the physical address of the property that needs to be treated, right? And for whatever pest it's going to be, because that next step is it indoor? Is it outdoor? What are you dealing with? Whatever the situation is, let us know a little bit about it because we're going to send that over to the vendor so they have a good starting point because it's going to make their job quicker with a re resolution to your problem. So sort of a concierge approach, right? You, you, you're you mm -hmm. there for the tenant. Uh, the tenant would um, submit some kind of a claim. And then yep. you would, I'm assuming, do you inform the property management company then that, hey, we got this claim? Tell us how that works. Yeah, right? absolutely. So as a property manager, you can actually see these claims come through anyway um, through the portal. I see. Um, okay. One. Um, but at the same time, you're still going to get the email of the service that has been performed. Um, just a service ticket says this service has been performed at this property uh, for this pest type and these products were used. I mean, pretty standard stuff for any um, pest control company out there. Uh, basically requirements of the Department of Ag in any state. We just need to have all that documented, one. Now, you as a property manager, you might have a maintenance manager on hand, or maybe you just want to handle it yourself. You can still make claims for that property uh, on the behalf of the tenant as well. And I have some who do act, the maintenance manager handles all of it. The tenants just report it, uh, whatever they're seeing with the uh, maintenance manager, and then they make the claim. 
Um, that's just an extra step. And if people feel comfortable with doing that, great. And not a problem. If, if they want to do it through the tenant, great. Not a problem. We have sometimes tenants who will call and they'll say, Hey man, you know, this isn't my problem. You know, this property's, you know, got these, got these ants. I mean, they're all over. Why, why should this be my problem? Right. And sometimes we have to make a call as to whether, all right, is this an issue where the tenant left dirty dishes out and that's attracted the ants, or is this potentially some sort of an epidemic infestation that's going on in the whole neighborhood? It's not really the tenant's fault, right? So should the landlord pay for it? So um, that's always kind of interesting, right? So what you're saying is that the tenant could make the claim or if my team, you know, my maintenance facilitator wanted to submit that claim on behalf of the tenant, then uh, we could do that on their behalf as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So then you guys are sort of the uh, triage point. You understand the problem, what's going on, and you would pick the proper pest control company to handle that particular issue? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we have already vetted them. Um, so we'll usually have about two to three on hand. Because, um, I mean, in a specific city, county, or whatever it is, there'll be multiple property management companies out there. One One pest control vendor is just not going to be able to handle all of them. So we want to have a, a proper turnaround. Usually it's within 48 hours for a contact um, of the uh, the resident of the property um, to make sure that they can get out there and treat it. But if they're overloaded, well, guess what? We still have others who can do that. And maybe there are some too where not all uh, pest control companies do treat termites or maybe they don't all treat bed bugs. So we need to make sure that we have the proper ones on hand. And that's why we thoroughly vet them before any claims ever come through. We'll have them all ready to go before the first claim is ever made. So you uh, reach out to people in different time zones, different zip codes, right? All over the country. Mm-hmm. And you vet pest control people and you sort of bring them under your umbrella as as vendors. That, yeah. Okay. And so you've got the power of volume behind you guys too, which helps our tenants, helps our owners. Exactly. Hey, we were chatting earlier a little bit about knowing, okay, whose responsibility it is. Is it the tenant or the landlord? And where do you kind of draw uh-huh. that delineation? And this is just a personal, you know, from your experience, I know you and your family have been in pest control for years, right? So at what point do you determine, okay, this is a tenant issue. Most leases say pest control is on the tenant. Almost mm-hmm. our, yep. our California lease says it, but there's also some reasonableness where, okay, now wait a minute, the tenant just moved in and they find out that once they moved in, that they've got a cockroach problem. That's not really on the tenant, right? The house should have been ready for that. Sure. And if it's not, it's kind of on the landlord. So where, where do you delineate Okay, landlord versus tenant responsibility when it comes to pest control. Here, I'll answer this fairly a little simpler than that. It doesn't matter at this point with pest share. Like that question's gone. Like there, it, you don't have to figure it out because it doesn't fall on anybody. It's already taken care of for the most part, for the covered pests anyway. So if I do make a distinct draw, something that is, a uh, a wood destroying organism, typically something that like termites mm. or carpenter ant or something to that effect that is going to damage um, the actual property itself um, and pretty significantly. And that usually goes over to the the owner of the property. Makes sense. Which yeah. I mean makes sense for most people. Beyond that, even the bed bugs and the roaches. I mean, sure, we cannot control for all pests, but at the same time. Why should you be, as an owner of the property, always be controlled? If we don't know who's responsible for uh, the problem, and we never do, that is just part of a natural uh, process of being a a renter. We just want to make it fair enough. Well, in this situation with pest share, look, sure, there are some damaging pests out there that are going to cause a real problem to the home. Yeah, that's likely going to go to the owner. But if we can't determine a source for something like roaches, because a tenant could bring them in, um, even with just their luggage, if the luggage is there before they actually move in, well, it's hard to tell. And I'll leave that up to the uh, property managers um, to make that distinction specifically. But if you don't want to, hey, this is, like I said, this is where it comes in because now you don't have to deal with it. Okay. So your program brings some other specific advantages to property managers as well, right? In terms of revenue sharing. And so can you explain how that works. Most property managers out there, you know, know about resident benefit packages and things like that, mm-hmm. or at least the idea of amenities. But now you have obviously a little bit of an admin fee on top of it. So make a dollar on it, make make some money on this because you're in business for a reason. And if you have a very viable uh, benefit, uh, then nobody's really going to complain about it anyway. Like pest control in this scenario, right, we're talking about pest share. This is kind of the whole point for me is pest control. We deal with 
very often. Take a look at exactly what you're offering. Um, are you providing real value uh, to either your owner, your tenant, and yourself? Because we look for that triple win. So what you're saying is you bundle it in with a resident benefit package. You're charging something for that package. So mm -hmm. in essence, you're you're able to make some revenue share or some amount of profit off of that yeah. particular program. Yeah. Whether it is just an added uh, to your lease agreement as a, just a standard amenity by itself or part of a resident benefit package. All right. You're a NARPM affiliate too, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I am. Okay. Are there any special programs or offers you have for NARPA members to connect with you or maybe sign up anything you got going there? So for all NARPA members specifically, it's, we usually have a $500 onboarding fee. Um, it is completely wiped away. There's nothing there. So it is null and void for you guys. Terrific. Okay. So there's a incentive to jump in, get involved with Pest Share, and, and uh, especially if you're an ARPA member. Absolutely. All right. Terrific. Hey, Tom, this has been a terrific conversation today, packed with lots of great information. I know we covered a lot of topics, you know, some of them probably just on the surface level, but thanks so much for coming on the show. I would love to continue, but in the interest of time, you know, we got to wrap up, get you back to your business day and me too. And so do you have any last words, I guess, for our listeners today? And if someone wants to connect with you to discuss this pest control and pest share and what it's all about in greater detail, what's the best way to get connected? Thanks for having me, Bob. Yeah, I always a pleasure talking with you. But as far as uh, getting a hold of me and contacting, simplest way, www.pestshare.com slash property managers is the easiest way to get a hold of us because you can schedule a demo. It links right to my Calendly and I'll see it right away. And that's pretty much what I live by anymore. Or if you, you know, do the old fashioned way, which I actually like the old fashioned way, um, typically is a phone call. <laughs> and I'm, it's weird that I'm calling that old fashioned, but 208-800-2744 is my cell phone. Terrific. Hey, thanks so much, Tom, for coming on the show. We really, really appreciate you being here. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks, Bob. As we wrap up today, I'd like to make another quick plug to our listeners to click on the subscribe button and give us a like. Also, please pay it forward with a positive review to help encourage more great guests to come on the show. That concludes today's episode of the Property Management Brainstorm. Thank you for joining. Until next time, we will be in the field working hard for our clients to maximize rental income and property value while maintaining top tenant relations. And we'll catch you next time.